Hello dear students, welcome to the lecture 6 of software engineering course. So the today's topic is architectural design. Let's start. We, uh, these below topics are covered in today's lectures. Architectural design decisions. Architectural views. Architectural patterns. Application architectures. Software architecture. The design process for identifying the subsystems making up a system and the framework for subsystem control and communication is architectural design. The output of this design process is a description of the software architecture. Okay, so what is the architectural design? It is the design process for identifying the subsystems making up a system and the framework for subsystem control and communication. So architectural design is about the systems that composes our system, systems and frameworks. Okay. And the output of this design process is a description of software architecture. Architectural design. An early stage of the system design process represents the link between specification and design processes, often carried out in parallel with some specification activities. It involves identifying major system components and their communications. Okay. The architecture of a packing robot control system. So, let's see the architecture of a packing robot. Okay, it has vision system, of course, to identify packages. And it has object identification system, which is dependent on the vision system. And from the combination of vision system and object identification system, there is arm controller system and grip controller system. By the way, this arm controller and grip control system also takes uh, input from packaging selection system and packaging system or just packaging system and the packaging selection system and packing packing system takes input from object identification system so we can uh, analyze it like this first the robot sees its environment then this environment data the image is sent to the object identification system then object identification system determines which packages will be selected to pack okay and then they are they need to pack it and to to pack them uh, or let's say to pack the certain object the selected objects packing system sends data to the arm controller and grip controller and arm controller and grip controller uses vision system and object identification system to pack those packages okay and there is also conveyor controller which also sends uh, output to the which also takes input from packing system architectural abstraction architecture in the small is concerned with the architecture of individual programs at this level, we are concerned with the way that an individual program is decomposed into components. Architecture in the large is concerned with the architecture of complex enterprise systems that include other systems, programs, and program components. These enterprise systems are distributed over different computers, which may be owned and managed by different companies. Advantages of explicit architecture. Stakeholder communication. Architecture may be used as a focus of discussion by system stakeholders. System analysis. Means that analysis of whether the system can meet its non-functional requirements is possible. 
large scale reuse. We have seen uh, what were the uh, non-functional requirements if you remember in our previous uh, lectures. The architecture may be reusable across a range of systems. Product line architectures may be developed. Architectural representations. Simple, informal block diagrams showing entities and relationships are the most frequently used method for documenting software architectures. Okay, so simple informal block diagrams are used uh, in mostly. But these have been criticized because they lack semantics, do not show the types of relationships between entities nor the visible properties of entities in the architecture. However, uh, this method has been crit criticized, criticized. Depends on the use of architectural models. The requirements for model semantics depends on how the models are used. Box and line diagrams. Very abstract, they do not show the nature of component relationships nor the externally visible properties of the subsystems. However, useful for communication with stakeholders and for project planning. Use of architectural models as a way of facilitating discussion about the system design. A high-level architectural view of a system is useful for communication with system stakeholders and project planning because it is not cluttered with detail. Stakeholders can relate to it and understand an abstract view of the system. They can then discuss the system as a whole without being confused by detail. Okay, so it is really important to have architectural model to discuss it with the stakeholders. So what, who were the stakeholders? If you remember it, let's look for a formal definition of it. Okay. In simple words, anyone having any type of relation, interest in the project is known as stakeholder. The term software project stakeholder refers to a person, group or company that is directly or indirectly involved in the project and who may affect or get affected by the outcome of the project. What is stakeholder identification? It is the process of identifying a person, group or a company which can affect or get affected by a decision, activity or the outcome of the software project. It is important in order to identify the exact requirements of the project and what various stakeholders are expecting from the project outcome. Okay, you, so you see uh, stakeholders are uh, categorized into two categories. First one is internal stakeholder and second one is external stakeholder. So project manager, project team, company founders are internal stakeholders and external stakeholders are customers, government, supplier and such. You see, even the developer can be a stakeholder because uh, they are also taking part of, they are also uh, uh, taking a part in the team. Okay, for example, project manager. Responsible for managing the whole project. Project manager is generally never involved in producing the end product, but he, she controls, monitors, and manages the activities involved in the production. Okay, there is project team. Performs the actual work of the project under the project manager, including development, testing, etc. 
Okay, so now you have you get the idea. So with architectural model, uh, it is much easier to discuss the project with stakeholders. Okay, it can be developer, it can be the company staff, it can be project manager, it can be uh, clients, external buyers, and such. Okay. As a way of documenting an architecture that has been designed. The aim here is to produce a complete system model that shows the different components in a system, their interfaces and their connections. Architectural Design Decisions Architectural design is a creative process so the process differs depending on the type of system being developed. Okay, this is important, the type of system. In software engineering, it is all, always important, the type of the system that you are going uh, to build. Okay, you have to consider that every time, in every case. However, a number of common decisions span all design processes and these decisions affect the non-functional characteristics of the system. Architectural design decisions Is there a generic application architecture that can be used? How will the system be distributed? What architectural styles are appropriate? What approach will be used to structure the system? How will the system be decomposed into modules? What control strategy should be used? How will the architectural design be evaluated? How should the architecture be documented? Architecture reuse. So you see these were the questions, the decisions, and now we are going to see each of them. We are starting with architecture reuse, which is the uh, topic of generic application architecture that can be used. Systems in the same domain often have similar architectures that reflect domain concepts. Application product lines are built around a core architecture with variants that satisfy particular customer requirements. The architecture of a system may be designed around one of more architectural patterns or styles. These capture the essence of an architecture and can be instantiated in different ways. Discussed later in this part. Architecture and system characteristics. Performance. Localize critical operations and minimize communications. Use large rather than fine grain components. Okay, security. Okay, for performance, localize critical operations and minimize communications. Which means that you won't be wasting resources or time to uh, get done your operations and communications in other um, perhaps platform or on other services and such okay for security use a layered architecture with critical assets in the inner layers this is important critical assets should not be usually visible to the uh, upper layers Localize safety critical features in a small number of subsystems. This was for safety and availability. Include redundant components and mechanisms for fault tolerance. And for maintainability. Use fine grain, replaceable components. Okay, so what does fine grain mean? in software development okay so some has already asked it okay there is a question in software engineering stack exchange com 
This should have the best answer, I believe. Coarser and finer grained means implementing more or less functionality respectively. It is somewhat related to the size too. So a fine grained service is something that does very little. Like a service that just multiples two numbers. A coarse grain service is something that does something more complex, like booking a room in a hotel. A medium grained service is usually something near the middle of this scale. Like a service that books only the money from your credit card but doesn't do anything else. It is very much subjective of course, and depends on the scales involved in your project. What he is saying there, if you use finer grain services, objects then obviously you need to communicate more because you need to speak to more services, objects. This also means that you are exposed to a lot more knowledge, because you have to understand some data and the choreography between calls. Okay. So if we use fine grain replaceable components, however, uh, that means uh, if something new is necessary, we can replace it with a better one and the whole system will continue to operate as it is supposed to be. Architectural views. So architectural views. Uh, okay, I think it is related to this one. What views or perspectives are useful when designing and documenting a system's architecture? What notations should be used for describing architectural models? Each architectural model only shows one view or perspective of the system. It might show how a system is decomposed into modules, how the runtime processes interact or the different ways in which system components are distributed across a network. For both design and documentation, you usually need to present multiple views of the software architecture. Four plus one view model of software architecture. A logical view, which shows the key abstractions in the system as objects or object classes. A process view, which shows how, at run time, the system is composed of interacting processes. A development view, which shows how the software is decomposed for development. A physical view, which shows the system hardware and how software components are distributed across the processors in the system. Related using use cases or scenarios, plus one. Okay, so there are four main views, which are a logical view, a process view, a development view, and a physical view. Okay. Architectural patterns. Patterns are a means of representing, sharing, and reusing knowledge. An architectural pattern is a stylized description of good design practice, which has been tried and tested in different environments. Patterns should include information about when they are and when they are not useful. Patterns may be represented using tabular and graphical descriptions. Okay. The model view controller MVC pattern. MVC pattern is very popular in uh, the software development uh, in the recent years. For example, there is a framework called as ASP.NET MVC. Uh, so the MVC framework, MVC approach, uh, is getting the new trend of software development. 
Model View Controller, usually known as MVC, is a software design pattern, one, commonly used for developing user interfaces that divides the related program logic into three interconnected elements. This is done to separate internal representations of information from the ways information is presented to and accepted from the user, two, three. Traditionally used for desktop graphical user interfaces GUIs, this pattern has become popular for designing web applications. Four popular programming languages like JavaScript, Python, Object Pascal, Delphi, Ruby, PHP, Java, C Sharp, and Swift have MVC frameworks that are used for web or mobile application development straight out of the box. Okay, so you see there is model updates view and from the view is displayed to the user then user uses the uh, view and this usage goes to the controller controller manipulates the model and it updates the view and such this is the uh, how the model works let's read each of them so the model is the central component of the pattern it is the application's dynamic data structure, independent of the user interface. 5. It directly manages the data, logic and rules of the application. So the model is the part which communicates with database, which updates the let's insert, select the database and such other things. So the weave is any representation of information such as a chart, diagram or table. Multiple views of the same information are possible, such as a bar chart for management and a tabular view for accountants. Okay, so the controller accepts input and converts it to commands for the model or view. 6. In addition to dividing the application into these components, the model view controller design defines the interactions between them. The model is responsible for managing the data of the application. It receives user input from the controller. The view means presentation of the model in a particular format. The controller responds to the user input and performs interactions on the data model objects. The controller receives the input, optionally validates it and then passes the input to the model. Okay, let's continue. As with other software patterns, MVC expresses the core of the solution to a problem while allowing it to be adapted for each system. Eight particular MVC designs can vary significantly from the traditional description here. Nine. Okay, so let's read the MVC pattern of uh, our example. So the description. Okay, it says figures nine three. Okay. Separates presentation and interaction from the system data. The system is structured into three logical components that interact with each other. The model component manages the system data and associated operations on that data. The view component defines and manages how the data is presented to the user. The controller component manages user interaction e.g., key presses, mouse clicks, etc. and passes these interactions to the view and the model. Okay, and so... Figure 6.4 shows the architecture of a web-based application system organized using the MVC pattern. It's, be, it is here, we will show that. used when there are multiple ways to view and interact with data. Also used when the future requirements for interaction and presentation of data are unknown. So what are the advantages of MVC? Allows the data to change independently of its representation and vice versa. Supports presentation of the same data in different ways with changes made in one representation shown in all of them. Uh, this is really important. For example, Think about that you are developing a software for uh, an Android application, an iOS application, a web application, and a Windows client-based application. You can use the model in every one of them. Okay. Only the view 
and the controller will change because how you interact with the software depends on the platform you are using however the model can stay perfectly same for every one of them and it would make your job much much easier uh, to manage all of the platforms at once okay and can, there can be some disadvantages as well can involve additional code and code complexity when the data model and interactions are simple this is true uh, doing a website for example in mvc pattern is really harder than doing just in a single page okay uh, in the uh, let's say primitive way it is much harder and complexer the organization of the model view controller okay so there is controller which does maps user actions to the model updates selects view and it goes to the change state okay it changed the state of the model encapsulates application state notifies the view of the state changes and then these go to the change notification to the view renders model requires model updates sends user events controller so the view feedbacks the model as well state query and controller feedbacks the view with view selection and view feedbacks the controller with user events okay and there is also a change of notification so this is how uh, an mvc of a web page okay or this is more like a general mvc model and there is web application architecture using mvc pattern so there is a browser uh for example this is a browser this this is chrome browser and from browser uh, we control the events events with controller http request processing application specific logic data validation and from there uh, we update the request and it goes to the, our uh, model business logic database and when model is updated it sends change notification to the view and we can also make a refresh request and from view dynamic page generation forms management and from view we do user events so this is how it is done form to display i will give an example what could be the view events and controllers from the Toros editor. Okay, so this is our view. The things we see. When I do an event, it will go to the controller to uh, update the model. Model is the data I am seeing on my screen. So, for example, from view, when I click this one, it will go to the controller and controller will load the new data and when uh, will request model to update and model will uh, update new data and when new data is up to, up, uh, updated it will be reflected back, back to the view okay so i am clicking this for example so the click event was the job of the controller then controller requested model to update data and data of the model is updated and then the view is refreshed with the navis data as you can see i am not saying that this website was done in mvc framework however if you have coded this website in mvc it would work like this okay in the next semester i am hopefully going to give the lecture uh, the course of asp.net mvc with uh, .net core 5 so please uh, subscribe and wait for that course if you are interested in mvc and web design web development layered architecture used to model the interfacing of subsystems organizes the system into a set of layers or abstract machines each of which provide a set of services supports the incremental development of subsystems in different layers when a layer interface changes only the adjacent layer is affected
however, often artificial to structure systems in this way. Okay, I will take a pause for a moment. All right, so the layered architecture pattern in the tabular view, name and layered architecture description. Organizes the system into layers with related functionality associated with each layer. A layer provides services to the layer above it so the lowest level layers represent core services that are likely to be used throughout the system. See figure 6.6. .6. Okay, we will see those figures. A layered model of a system for sharing copyright documents held in different libraries, as shown in figure 6.7. Okay, so when use it. Used when building new facilities on top of existing systems, when the development is spread across several teams with each team responsibility for a layer of functionality, when there is a requirement for multi-level security. You know, uh, working as a separate teams uh, is like uh, a mandatory thing for the uh, corporate uh, software, I mean the corporate level software. Because when you are working on a big software, uh, a professional software, a small, a, a, a single team uh, would have hard time to complete it. Therefore, you have to have multiple teams. You may compose a, a single team which is very big. However, a, a single team with a lot of uh, developers would be harder to manage. So best way is composing uh, several teams based on the uh, developer's experience and assigning them to the particular uh, layers based on their expertise and such. Okay, so advantages of layered architectures. Allows replacement of entire layers so long as the interface is maintained. Redundant facilities, e.g., authentication, can be provided in each layer to increase the dependability of the system. Okay, so what are the disadvantages? In practice, providing a clean separation between layers is often difficult and a high-level layer may have to interact directly with lower-level layers rather than through the layer immediately below it. Performance can be a problem because of multiple levels of interpretation of a service request as it is processed at each layer. So a generic layered architecture, uh, you see there is user interface at the highest level. User interface management authentication and authorization, one layer below user interface. And under it, core business logic, application functionality, system utilities. And at the very lower layer, system support, uh, operation system database, and such. So the architecture of uh, library uh, system. Okay, let's see the library management system. Okay, so there is a web browser interface which the users, clients uh, interact with the system in this. In, uh, in this layer, then there is login and forms and query manager and pinit manager layer. So this layer handles all these three uh, different uh, operations. And under that, there is distributed search, document retrieval, write manager, and accounting. So uh, actually, all layers under the bro under uh, the browser interface are usually at the server side okay for her, uh, perhaps the print manager can be at the client side uh, forms and query manager can be at the client side but would need uh, verification at the server side and login will be of course at the server side and then distributor search document retrieval rights manager accounting on under that there is there is library index and under that there are uh, databases so the key points uh, of so far, let's see them. A software architecture is a description of how a software system is organized. 
Architectural design decisions include decisions on the type of application, the distribution of the system, the architectural styles to be used. Architectures may be documented from several different perspectives or views such as a conceptual view, a logical view, a process view, and a development view. Architectural patterns are a means of reusing knowledge about generic system architectures. They describe the architecture, explain when it may be used and describe its advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so uh, lecture 6 architectural design part 2. Okay, let's start. Uh, repository architecture. Subsystems must exchange data. This may be done in two ways. Okay, so, so the first way. Shared data is held in a central database or repository and may be accessed by all subsystems. And Each subsystem maintains its own database and passes data explicitly to other subsystems. When large amounts of data are to be shared, the repository model of sharing is most commonly used as this is an efficient data sharing mechanism. So yes, having a central database or repository is better when there are uh, large amounts of data uh, because let's say you have 100 subsystems and if they maintain their own databases that would cause a, a lot of unnecessary resources to use, usage and perhaps the synchronization issues and such. So having a single central database is a better and more common solution. The repository pattern. Okay, so the description of the repository pattern is. All data in a system is managed in a central repository that is accessible to all system components. Components do not interact directly, only through the repository. Okay, so the example. Figure 6.9 is an example of an IDE where the components use a repository of system design information. Each software tool generates information which is then available for use by other tools. Okay, when it is used, when this repository pattern is used. You should use this pattern when you have a system in which large volumes of information are generated that has to be stored for a long time. You may also use it in data-driven systems where the inclusion of data in the repository triggers an action or tool. Okay, so what are the advantages of repository uh, pattern? Components can be independent, they do not need to know of the existence of other components. Changes made by one component can be propagated to all components. All data can be managed consistently, e.g., backups done at the same time, as it is all in one place. So what are the disadvantages, uh, which is also an important factor to take into consideration? The repository is a single point of failure so problems in the repository affect the whole system. May be inefficiencies in organizing all communication through the repository. Distributing the repository across several computers may be difficult. Yes, okay. So this single point of failure is an important fact. Uh, therefore, you have to uh, have proper backups and proper uh, failure, um, let's say, uh, scenarios uh, to be prepared. Okay, so it is not all about advantages, but also there are disadvantages that you have to consider. So a repository architecture for an IDA, integrated development environment, such as a Visual Studio. So there is design translators, UML editors, code generators, project repository, design analyzer, and report generator, Python editor, and Java editor. So this is based on the uh, design for this particular IDA. Uh, IDA. You see there is project repository. Actually, we are also having a repository for our courses, which is, you should already know it. I will be posting everything here 
I am also posting currently and your pro your final project will be also uploaded to here the details of it so you see for every lecture I have separate repository I am up updating them uploading them with this way uh, students are able to uh, get whatever I share within a synchronization anyway let's continue I also have private repositories for my own projects and they are extremely useful. Client server architecture. Distributed system model which shows how data and processing is distributed across a range of components. Can be implemented on a single computer. Set of standalone servers which provide specific services such as printing, data management, etc. Set of clients which call on these services. Network which allows clients to access servers. Client server architecture is mandatory uh, if you are uh going to have uh security requirements okay for example you have a subscription based system or uh for for uh, practically for almost every online uh, tool you need client server architecture what i mean is if you have uh, if you are selling a product that requires online authentication or online data saving or something that is online if it is not just offline standalone application you have to have a server which will process the sensitive information at the server side uh, such as keep the database there or such as make the authentication and, and everything or make the database connections you have to have a server uh, side running application and then there will be of course a client side application such as web uh, websites or uh, windows based uh, applications however all of them will be co will communicate with a server uh, side uh, ser uh, software as well the client server pattern okay so the description in a client-server architecture, the functionality of the system is organized into services, with each service delivered from a separate server. Clients are users of these services and access servers to make use of them. Of course, you can have a separate server or you can have single server. However, if it is client-server pattern, you should have separate server for each service, like printer service or like... Um, authentication service or other things figure 6.11 is an example of a film and video dvd library organized as a client server system used when data in a shared database has to be accessed from a range of locations because servers can be replicated may also be used when the load on a system is variable okay what are the advantages the principal advantage of this model is that servers can be distributed across a network. General functionality, e.g., a printing service, can be available to all clients and does not need to be implemented by all services. Okay, what are the disadvantages? Each service is a single point of failure so susceptible to denial of service attacks or server failure. Performance may be unpredictable because it depends on the network as well as the system. May be management problems if servers are owned by different organizations. Okay, you see uh, this denial of service attack. These are uh, pretty uh, severe uh, threats to your uh, servers. And having multiple servers would increase the protection cost. Uh, therefore this is a truly disadvantage single point of failure is 
uh, true but it is true for everything and uh, unless you uh, have uh, redundant servers or services and uh, management is also uh, a problematic issue so you have to decide yourself whether have multiple servers for multiple services or have single server it is up to you a client server architecture for a film library okay so there are clients which are being users or customers and there is internet and then each client can connect each one of these uh, servers services so one client can access catalog server library catalog the other one can access video server film store the other one can access picture server photo store or the other one can access web server film and photo information so you see each uh, category of information have been separated has been separated into different uh, servers this can have another uh, advantage for example one client want to be a video server and another one wants to uh, be a picture server and picture server gets down and in that case only client 3 would be affected so client 2 can have its uh, service as uh, expected okay pipe and filter architecture functional transformations process their inputs to produce outputs may be referred to as a pipe and filter model as in unix shell variants of this approach are very common when transformations are sequential this is a batch sequential model which is extensively used in data processing systems not really suitable for interactive systems okay so let's uh, get more information to understand this better so the pipe and filter pattern so let's read the description the processing of the data in a system is organized so that each processing component filter is discrete and carries out one type of data transformation the data flows as in a pipe from one component to another for processing Figure 6.13 is an example of a pipe and filter system used for processing invoices. Okay, so when use it. Commonly used in data processing applications, both batch and transaction based, where inputs are processed in separate stages to generate related outputs. Okay, so what are the advantages? easy to understand and supports transformation reuse workflow style matches the structure of many business processes evolution by adding transformations is straightforward can be implemented as either a sequential or concurrent system okay so what are the disadvantages the format for data transfer has to be agreed upon between communicating transformations each transformation must parse its input and unparse its output to the agreed form. This increases system overhead and may mean that it is impossible to reuse functional transformations that use incompatible data structures. Okay, so that is an example of the pipe and filter architecture. So pipe and filter uh, in this uh, example is used for invoices. So there is invoices incoming and they are read issued invoices, identify payments and there is also payments and then issue receipts and find payments due, issue receipts are going to receipts and find payments due is going to issue payment reminder and then it goes to the reminders. So there is a piping and filtering as you can see. application architectures application systems are designed to meet an organizational need as businesses have much in common their application systems also tend to have a common architecture that reflects the application requirements 
A generic application architecture is an architecture for a type of software system that may be configured and adapted to create a system that meets specific requirements. Use of application architectures As a starting point for architectural design. As a design checklist. As a way of organizing the work of the development team. As a means of assessing components for reuse. As a vocabulary for talking about application types. Okay. Examples of application types. Data processing applications. Data-driven applications that process data in batches without explicit user intervention during the processing. Transaction processing applications. Data-centered applications that process user requests and update information in a system database. Event processing systems. Applications where system actions depend on interpreting events from the system's environment. Language processing systems. Applications where the user's intentions are specified in a formal language that is processed and interpreted by the system. Okay, so data processing applications. Let's uh, give an example of each one of these. I think uh, they are given in the following uh, slides. Application type examples. Focus here is on transaction processing and language processing systems. Transaction processing systems. E-commerce systems. Reservation systems. Language processing systems. Compilers and command interpreters. I think I will also give an example to data processing applications. Okay, for example, uh, Google has data processing applications. And let's say when they crawl websites, they are doing batch data processing. So their, uh, one of their type of application is data processing applications. So for transaction processing applications, uh, they are data centered applications and you, uh, that processes user requests and update information in a system database. For example, Facebook has transaction processing applications. For event processing applications, I think autonomous cars or any system that is autonomous can be given because uh, they are uh, processing the environment input. Okay, so whatever the whatever event happens uh, they are taking action based on them for example you are your car is moving on the street and then a car appears uh, in front of you it is coming from another direction or uh, uh, it is uh, starting to move when it was stationary uh, that is event event processing application system event processing application and also there is language processing systems for example this text to speech is also language processing system the uh, opposite is also same uh, as you know we are already generating subtitles for our videos in that case uh, it is converting speech into the text so it is all uh, they are both language processing systems Okay, let's continue. Okay, we have read it. Transaction processing systems. Process user requests for information from a database or requests to update the database. From a user perspective, a transaction is any coherent sequence of operations that satisfies a goal. 
For example, find the times of flights from London to Paris. Users make asynchronous requests for service which are then processed by a transaction manager. Okay, so the structure of transaction processing applications, input-output processing, which gets the input from the user, application logic, uh, which turns the user input into the, let's say, set of commands, there is transaction manager and database. You see, they are all uh, double-sided, so transaction manager uh, takes information from database and also sends information to database. Same applies to all of them. Okay. The software architecture of an ATM system. So ATM system, ATMs are the machines that we uh, send money or withdraw money or receive money and such. So what are the inputs of an ATM? Get customer account ID. We enter our, uh, we, we may use card based, uh, we can do card based transaction or we can do online based transaction. So it can get customer account ID or validate card. And after uh, these are done, then we select the service. We are going to send money or receive money or withdraw money. And then our uh, service request is processed by query account and update account. Then output is the print details, return card and dispense, dispense cash. Okay, this is so simplistic overview of the system. It is actually much more complex here than this, of course. Information systems architecture. Information systems have a generic architecture that can be organized as a layered architecture. These are transaction-based systems as interaction with these systems generally involves database transactions. So, so the layers include... So the layers include the user interface, user communications, information retrieval, system database. Okay. For example, Google is an information system, Google search, I mean, it has user interface, user communications, information civil and system database. Okay, layered information system architecture, there is user interface, user communications, authentication and authorization, information retrieval and modification, transaction management database. The archi architecture of mental health care uh, patient management system so there is web browser and you do login after login it uh, the system does role checking and then form and menu manager appears based on your ro role and when you enter data or update data or delete data the data validation is done and in the lower level there is security management patient information manager data import and export and report generation and at the very low level, transaction management patient database system. Okay. Okay. Web based information systems. Information and resource management systems are now usually web based systems where the user interfaces are implemented using a web browser. Uh, why do you think this is becoming a new standard? Because uh, web pages are uh, available to almost every device. And when you update the web service, it is updated with the, all of the devices. Okay. So it is much easier to manage and update. For example, e-commerce systems are internet-based resource management systems that accept electronic orders for goods or services and then arrange delivery of these goods or services to the customer. In an e-commerce system, the application-specific layer includes additional functionality supporting a shopping cart in which users can place a number of items in separate transactions, then pay for them all together in a single transaction. Okay. 
Server implementation. These systems are often implemented as multi-tier client server architectures. The web server is responsible for all user communications with the user interface implemented using a web browser. The application server is responsible for implementing application-specific logic as well as information storage and retrieval requests. The database server moves information to and from the database and handles transaction management. Language processing systems Accept a natural or artificial language as input and generate some other representation of that language. May include an interpreter to act on the instructions in the language that is being processed. Used in situations where the easiest way to solve a problem is to describe an algorithm or describe the system data. Meta case tools process tool descriptions, method rules, etc. and generate tools. The architecture of a language processing system. Okay, so there is source language instructions, then there is translator, check syntax, check semantics, generate, and there is then abstract um, C instructions, then there is interpreter, which fetches and executes data, and then Results are provided to the user. Okay. Compiler components. A lexical analyzer, which takes input language tokens and converts them to an internal form. A symbol table, which holds information about the names of entities, variables, class names, object names, etc., used in the text that is being translated. A syntax analyzer, which checks the syntax of the language being translated. A syntax tree, which is an internal structure representing the program being compiled. Okay, more of compiler components. A semantic analyzer that uses information from the syntax tree and the symbol table to check the semantic correctness of the input language text. A code generator that walks the syntax tree and generates abstract machine code. Okay, so what is a compiler component? I mean, what is a compiler? Compilers are uh, software that uh, converts the code into the machine code. So machine can uh, process that information. So let's give a more example. So I will give an example of C sharp compiler. Okay. So we write our code like this, uh, which is written in the English, as you can see and then this code has to be compiled into the uh, machinery code okay the machine cannot handle this what machine can handle is the uh, cpu supporting commands okay so and okay let's read this Have you ever wondered what happens to your C-sharp code when it runs on your computer? Probably not, but it's worth a look. A long time ago, when computer programming was in its infancy, programmers wrote programs in machine codes, language that the processor could understand. It looked like this. Okay, yes, this is the machine code. And one upper level of machine code is the assembly code. Not exactly the easiest read, right? When writing machine codes, you tell the processor the exact address of the memory location at which to read and write data. Every command is represented by a number, and because that isn't complicated enough, commands differ among different processors. 
this is true uh, therefore amd is paying uh, money to intel for x uh, ad6 instruction set so they can both run the windows on them to avoid this complexity, clever people started to invent abstractions and write programs on a higher level than the raw machine code. They designed programming languages that allow you to write code without worrying about the under-the-hood stuff like memory management, how to handle different hardware, and many other things that we as high-level programmers may not even know about. Okay, so what happens your code, then compiler takes that code and turns it into the machine code okay okay so this is a really long article if you wonder that you can check it so here the explained thing is a compiler okay so it takes the input language tokens and convert them to internal form and then symbol table which loads information about names of entities and such it is an extremely highly detailed and complex uh, software we can say that i wonder if there is any information Yeah, I think it's hard to find. Anyway, let's continue. A pipe and filter compiler architecture. Okay, so there is first lexical analysis. If you uh, write incorrect uh, data names, variable types names, uh, your compiler may give an error to you before start even compiling. Okay, so. Uh, for each programming language, how the compiler behave different. However, in every one of them, there is lexical analysis. Uh, we check symbol table, syntax tree. Then there is synthetic analysis, which also access symbol table, syntax tree. Then there is semantic analysis. And then finally, code generation. Uh, repository architecture for a language processing system. So there is pretty printer, editor, lexical analyzer, syntax analyzer semantic analyzer optimizer code generator and they are accessing the abstract syntax tree grammar definition symbol table output definition so what are the key points of the chapter two in this lecture models of application systems architectures help us understand and compare applications validate application system designs and assess large-scale components for reuse Transaction processing systems are interactive systems that allow information in a database to be remotely accessed and modified by a number of users. Language processing systems are used to translate texts from one language into another and to carry out the instructions specified in the input language. They include a translator and an abstract machine that executes the generated language. Okay, so all right, I think uh, this is enough for today. Hopefully, see you next week. Uh, in your project, you will be needed to uh, design uh, such. Uh, representations and uh, UML diagrams of your software so it will be like this you will be needed to uh, pick a project yourself it, it will be a programming project and based on your programming uh, based on your uh, software you will generate the UML design or the descriptions example a tabular design and such of your uh, project like we are seeing here okay i will explain the details later okay so hopefully see you next week end of lecture